Good evening. My name is David Duclos, and tonight we drift all the way back to France in 1878. Cozy up under the blankets and prepare for a good night's sleep. And when you are ready, close your eyes. We have left the bustle of Paris by train for the lush green countryside of Pays de Loire. The landscape is scruffy with hills and woods which echo with the bird song of early summer. Farmers work their fields, turning the fertile soil like their families have done for centuries. Claude, a talented impressionist painter, has met us in his village. He will show us his studio and the countryside that is his muse, inviting you to experience the tranquil scenery that inspires his dreamy works of art. Ah, you have arrived. Good. Welcome to Saint-Aubin. Sit here, close to the fire. It can get a little damp before dawn here, even in summer. So, you wish to understand why I paint the way I do? That is why I asked you to meet me here, in the countryside. I must show you how different the place of life is in the Pays de Loire. It is not something you can just explain. My studio is cozy and cluttered. The small building used to be a farmer's cottage, but now serves as a guest house for travelers. It was built several centuries ago, and it has been built to last. The pleasant smell of the countryside fills the room, and that's how I like it. Smoke, dry old wood, freshly cut hay, wild flowers, with a hint of farm animals for a bass note. My hands, as well as my clothing, are dotted with constellations of colorful paint spots. I should have tidied up my painting supplies. They are scattered everywhere. There is a stack of well-used pallets on the windowsill. Several wooden easels lean on the far wall. My sweater and my rain jacket hung over a wicker chair in the corner by the fireplace. I have nowhere else to put them. The two small tables are where I store my paint for a lack of a better place. There are hundreds of tubes of paint with a jumbled rainbow of colored labels. Some are pristine and fat with paint. Others are crumpled and twisted to empty them of their contents. A jar filled with dozens of pen brushes sits in the center of one of the tables like a floral centerpiece. The bristles of each brush are a slightly different shade of brown with a similar diversity of shapes. Each one has its use. Outside my window, the gray skies of early morning are gladdening to cheerful smears of lemon and peach. I look out and smile. I throw open the window's shutters and let the freshness of the countryside in. I inhale deeply. <sighs> the delicate scent of flowers comes through first. It is joined by hints 
of muskiness from dark muddy ditches. The sound of its trickling waters burbles steadily as it flows past the old mill. Life is wonderfully slow here in the Pays de la Loire. Time in the countryside is exactly what the soul needs. Here, there is not the constant to and fro of carriages rushing outside the window. Well, Monsieur Le May's hay wagon does go by twice a day, but it is slow. The rhythm of those old wooden wheels is part of nature itself. Victoire, the gentle old horse that pulls the wagon, surely has been pulling hay since the time of the revolution. Do you want to know how sleepy it is in Saint-Aubin? Three weeks ago, we had a thrilling hailstorm pass through here. It damaged Madame Jobert's spear orchard. That is still the talk of this valley, and it will be for another month. That's how quiet it is out here. Deliciously boring. From somewhere in the distance, a rooster yodels the morning's first song. The high notes echo through the land, suspended in the haze. There, hear that? That is the French countryside. Would you believe that when I heard my first rooster, it startled me? I was fresh in from Paris, where one must be wary. In this village, there is a leisurely pace to every element of life. A farmer's thoughts do not race and jumble together to keep up with the heartbeat of the capital. There is no need for that. The countryside itself keeps the beat and dictates the rhythm. We rise and fall with the sun. The roosters know when the time has arrived to celebrate another dawn. Paris is Paris, and the countryside is France. Do you understand? Don't get me wrong, Paris is my lifeblood, my heart, but the countryside of France is my soul. I walk over to a large canvas that is leaning against the wall. It depicts a dreamy, almost unfinished landscape of hills descending into the horizon. A few brush strokes of a sap green mix create a tree, and single stab of orange makes a line of bushes. You have to paint quickly if you want to be faithful to the light. There is no time for the details of each tree. You must be spontaneous if you want to capture the colors. The sun? Well, the sun is the engine of light, but it is fickle. I draw my finger across the speckled egg blue sky on the canvas. Then I tap a scruffy line of green and orange bushes that runs alongside a small road in the foreground. Paris has many things, but I could never get the light right there. Ironic in the city of light. The light here at dusk is magic. The clementine cinders of sunset throw gilded light on the blackberry bushes, if only for a few moments. 
Would you believe it took me almost a week of experimenting with paints at sunset to recreate that exact color there? But these were not wasted moments. We only get so many sunsets in our lives. While this number is not for us to know, we must never waste the opportunity to take one in. I hope you agree with me about that. Never waste a sunset. I pluck a dry flower from a vase by the window. Look at this flower. Yes, it is a beautiful object, but it is still just one object in a pot. Lit by a lamp as it is, you are not seeing its true character. You must see it dance in wild circles on the morning breeze, anchored into the earth with its long stem. You have to see this flower in its true context. See it as part of a great throng of other flowers and the grasses that protect them. I pluck out several dried petals and examine them closely. This humble flower is a blank canvas for the elements. To witness these white petals glow in the flames of twilight is to know them truly. These petals will reflect the melancholy purple of the surrounding daylight for only a brief moment. I know this because I have tried and failed to find that perfect shade inside of my paint tubes, but that one has eluded me for thus far. I place the flower back in the vase. This is what impressionists, as we are called, try so hard to do. To capture these fleeting colors, these natural accidents. Painting outdoors in the fresh air of the countryside, that is the only way to find these hidden colors. Another medium-sized canvas catches my attention. I balance it on the table and stare at it for a long moment. I am a proud father, looking upon the child, who I have realized is a perfect and divine creation in every way. The painting depicts a different valley than the first canvas. It is filled with an array of small, detailed greenery. The angled corners of several farm buildings grope out of the landscape in places, giving the impression of a small agricultural settlement. The scene is dominated by a flat-topped hill which looms on the horizon. It glows as if lit from within by the awakening dawn. The lines are blurred and rough in places, as if drawn with one swift stroke and never refined later in the studio like the previous school of painters would have deemed necessary. There is a sense of motion to the lines, an urgency. I gaze at the landscape, and it makes me smile. I feel as if I am traveling through a faraway land. Here, this one I finished last week. It is that ridge just outside of town. There, 
on their far side. That big wrinkly green is the one they call the giant. To me, it looks more like a piece of baguette, but I don't think that will catch on. So, you can tell from looking at this painting that it was a sunny summer morning in our valley. See this soft glow on the far side? Of course, that is the low morning sun. In fact, you can look at it and gather that it was just past 10.30 in the morning when this moment was captured, more or less. If you know this valley, then that is something you can do. I'm sure the farmers that live in those houses could tell you what month this was painted, maybe even the week. I run my fingers over the miniature creases and mounds of color again, the topography of the paint itself. This deep orange and the way it settles into the folds of that hill, is it not a kind of magic? I went through maybe four different tubes of cadmium red light and several of lemon yellow and yellow ochre too. I could never get that exact shade of orange until this. See how it looks like it's glowing, like stained glass? Well, that takes some trying, you know. Do you see what I tried to do here on this canvas? The light kept changing because of the clouds and the time of day. So that is why the light fades and flickers over the landscape like this. Life is fleeting and so is every moment within it. I stand up and open the front door. Good. But here we are talking about this place while stuck inside my little studio. Let's go. Come on. I will show you how this valley has become my muse. Such a charming place. I throw some paints into my wicker basket and sling it over my shoulder. I pick up a small easel, then head out. The heavy summer sun is still groping its way towards the high point in the sky. Not a single cloud has yet been painted across the blank blue canvas. I walk along the narrow road, which has been hardened by generations of farm carts. Good morning, Henri. I greet Henri, the baker, who is out front on his white apron, hands on hips, taking in the morning. A small cup of coffee steams on the window sill beside him. He waves to me with a withered smile. I give him a coin and tuck a crooked baguette under my arm. You would have to travel five villages down the road to find a better baguette than Henri's. Next door, tools and flowers hang in the window of the town's only shop. Baskets of fresh eggs are displayed on the cobbles. In no time at all, I have left the handful of buildings behind and find myself in the countryside. To either side of the winding cart track ahead is a kaleidoscope of endless shades of green, impenetrable thorny ditches, wild seas of waving grass, Stately stands of sycamore trees punctuate the fields in shimmering lines and dots. 
The path winds past the farm of Madame Jobert, whose family has been farming here for countless generations. A ragged stone fence minders alongside the road. Many of its ancient stones have fallen down in places. The stones are coated in a paisley of mosses and lichens. The yellows and greens interwine like tendrils of smoke. There is no greater artist than nature herself. A small bird flushes from underfoot and settles on a fence post just ahead. It twitches its tail in alarm before determining that I am no threat. The brown bird has a corn silk yellow face and chest that are stricken with bold black stripes. We are in luck. A yellow hammer. Perhaps it will favor us with a morning song. The yellow hammer flaps up its feathers as if composing itself. Then, indeed, launches into song. A sublime cascade of metallic sheems spills from its quivering beak. I raise my index finger and swirl it through the air in time with the bird's song, like a conductor trying to keep pace with an over-eager orchestra. A series of lifting phrases cuts through the thickness of the morning air. After several verses, the yellow hammer tilts its head this way and that, lets out a single tear skull, then drops back into the green tangle and vanishes. But its outburst seems to have awakened the spirit of song in the field. Within moments, a robin begins to sing from the low branches of a nearby oak tree. Another robin responds from the next field over, as if in a melodic conversation. A field fair lets loose a waterfall of trebly bird song from some hidden perch, and then a blackbird. Several other species I cannot identify join in in the morning chorus. Surrounded by the dervish of bird song, I continue down the path. The sun is on my face, and a soft breeze carries a bouquet of wild flowers from several fields over. I hold my arms to the sky and walk several slow spirals down the path as if in rapture. I wear a huge smile that lines my face with happy creases. There, has the country not already won you over? Do you not see now how it nourishes the very soul? There is nothing that Paris can offer that comes anywhere close to this. Several gentle cows lumber over to the fence. I study them. I take note of how the shadows settle in the complex contours of bones and muscles under their spotted hides. The cows sniff the air, then grow disinterested and carry on chewing the grass. Just here on the left, do you see those bushes? These are the best blackberries in all of France, without a bit of exaggeration. Come on, it has grown over a bit, the weeds on the trail, but we can get there. 
Mind those needles and we will be fine. I fill my mouth with the plump berries, eating them as far as my hands can pick. After eating my fill, I walked back to the road. My fingers are stained with dark berry juice, and I wear a satisfied expression of bliss. Best blackberries in France. I told you it was true. I pause when my boots cross a long shadow. On the right side of the narrow road stands a crumbling stone tower. It looks like the remnants of a castle, an old chateau. Jagged stone knuckles protrude from where the roof once had been, and the bottom half is wrapped in a patchwork of dark green vines. Oh, look at this one. Would you believe I never noticed it before? So focused as I was on the blackberries on the other side of the road. The vines stretch to the ground and carry on through the wild field in unkept rows. I approach the closest clump of vines and discover a bounty of grapes clustered here and there on the vines. This must be an abandoned vineyard. How wonderful. I must ask the innkeeper about the history of this old place. I crouch low in front of the grapes. The morning dew still clings to their purple skin. The cluster of grapes glisten and shrub the perfect morning light, like a treasure of forgotten diamonds. Well, I will have to include all of this in a painting. Maybe I will wait until those grapes get a little bigger. But I will be back. I carry on walking up a gentle hill, then turn into a field of tall grass. Everything we have been shown today, all of that will be in the next canvas I paint. Maybe you will not see the yellow hammer singing, or smell the ditches and fields, but I will show you those things nonetheless. There is a trick. I will use color, light, lines. I will try my best. You may not taste the blackberries, but you will know they are there. Maybe I will even use the juice of the berries themselves when I mix my color for that. But I can't tell you all my secrets, can I? The sun beams down from almost directly overhead, shrinking shadows with its bright yellow light. I push through the grassy field to an era where the sunlight is dappled by the time-worn oaks and poplars that stand guard. I sit in a patch of lush, amber grass, softer than any bed. I survey the field, roll my jacket up for a pillow, and then lay back into the embrace of the grass. The leaves above shush and wave with the help of a light breeze. The nearby stream bubbles and trickles, adding to the lazy natural rhythm of a late morning. There is a sweetness of filled flowers, heavy in the air here. 
The sun is so warm and soothing on my face. I feel like I am lifting slowly above the fields. The last thing I see before my eyelids close is a thin slice of blue, almost like the profound cerulean blue of the countryside sky. But in truth, it is a color no paint could ever reproduce. I trust you have found our trip to the French countryside to have been a relaxing experience. Let the hush of the swearing grasses be your lullaby. You are as light as the wispy clouds that drift high above the fields. You will be carried off to a place that is safe and calm. A land of painted dreams where the sun is warm on your face and the sleep is deep and restful. Good night and sweet dreams.